Well, well, well. Right, well. I always give it about a second. And a big deep breath. Get your brain into gear, if we have one. Very and more than then so. say, welcome everybody to uh, England. We're not in Wales. <laughs> We're not in Wales. I've moved, I've moved abroad for the day. Electricity in yeah. So, welcome. We are in the uh, yard, aren't we? As in the drum... Yeah. What are we called? Drum vintage bunker. drum yard. Vintage drum yard. Because <laughs> yard is vintage, but he's a drummer. <laughs> That's why. Look at this. Do you know what's amazing? Again, I have a shop and I love my shop. I go in every day and then I come here and I'm like, I want this shop instead. <laughs> this is lovely. It's really sweet. Look at this. So who's this from? That's one of Steve Gads. <clears throat> Mr. Gads. Yeah. But more importantly than Mr. Gads today is Mr. Yard. Now then, Yard, tell folk how you pronounce your surname. Gavridovic. There you go. I'm not going to attempt it because I'm used Please. to it. So tell us a little bit about you first, Yard. Where do you originate and right. your family here? Right. I was born in Dubrovnik, Croatia, which is a beautiful city. And if you know anything about it, it's, it's one of the special places in the world. And uh, we had a home right on the seafront enjoying the views of the Adriatic and then we moved to England when <clears> I was about four years old. And you're not far from the water here, are you? Yeah. Close. Apart from my time yeah. living in London. Yeah, excellent. So, you, which I didn't realise, I knew you had some sense, but you've got five boys, yeah? Yeah. yeah. And they're all in the music industry or some of them? Uh, four of them play drums. Wow. And one of them plays, and they play other things as well. Um, but one of them is primarily a guitar player. Right. He plays drums also. So with the four boys playing drums, is there a bit of competition between them? No, no. They're, they're all got different styles and, you know. You don't come things. for Sunday lunch and argue who's the best drummer? No, there's no, there's no such thing as the best drummer. No, I you agree. Know, just, they, they all help each other. Two of them write music together and you know, they're, they're all sort of behind each other. That's good, yeah. Because sometimes brothers can be a little, you know what I mean? It's like, oh, they're brothers, are they? Yeah, we just play out on one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I've come all the way up here, because it's, it's a privilege for me, believe it or not, because Yard has been very kind, actually, to, to carry it and what we are attempting to do back home. And he's been very good, and we've talked yep. on Messenger and me. Yeah. And, um, and I said, I, you know, this is more important for me than than you know even like with a famous drum as it as it were because it's the experience of someone like yard with the work that he has done uh within the industry and for people like mr steve gad and so on so that's what we're going to tap into a couple of little bits and bobs with yard now so what can we learn from him and what experiences he had so tell us a little bit about who you've worked for you see there's the hulba there and yeah. mr gad for here yeah, um, well, it's hard to <laughs> remember on, on the spur of it. But, uh, I've worked with every drummer that's played for Eric in the last 25 years. Um, Baroni, um, obviously Gad, who's got kind of a regular. Steve Jordan, <coughs> Henry Spinetti, who's a big favourite of mine, lovely man. Um, Vinnie Colliuta. Um, all kinds. Of and you've been a bit further than England as well, haven't you? Yeah. Doing it. Yeah. Been around. Think, we've been around the world about 35 times. There you go. Yeah. So we're going to talk bearing edges later, a little bit, and tuning. My, my feeling is with that, if you wish to argue with a man of uh, Yard's calibre of where he's been and how many times he's tuned and how many people he's looked after, there's one person to ask, and that is yourself. And it is pointless arguing, isn't it? I'm not going to sit here and argue with you, because actually I agree with most of it anyway. <laughs> but why would you? You you tap into people's experience. It's no substitute yeah. for experience, is I there? do the same. I, I tap into the experience of the drummer. And um, as we were saying, I, I always talk to the drummer before we get going, find out their likes, dislikes, whole thing how they want to feel comfortable. So I start with a, a clean slate with every drummer, because they're all different, and they probably end up sounding the same, but to them, that's their own personal sound. But this, a lot of the sound actually comes from the way they play. Yes. You know, it's that. That's key. You know. yeah. well, one funny thing was, uh, 
and I was on the kit because we do the sound checks. You know, the band sort of just come in and jump up on stage, but the, the crew band do the sound checks. And we've got a fabulous, mainly Welsh sound crew from your way. Yes. And um, a lot. Yep. And uh, and they are excellent. And they because I'm not technical at all. I don't even do electronic kits. <laughs> right. So. One day I was playing the kit, and our, sat, our late monitor man, he said to me, the good thing about you working for GAD is you hit at a similar weight, because I can see it on my desk. And I said, are you telling me I play like GAD? He said, no. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, that's all my glory gone. <laughs> But so, it's, it's great to know from people who, who really know their job. Yeah, and, yeah. And they're not. But it's the experience there. You've been there where there's a problem and you have to solve it, and that's how you end up and knowing what drums yeah, need. You've got to pay attention. Them. Yeah. You've and you, you know what they want and why. And the other thing is, our sound crew you know, started with your lot down there, man. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And um, they've been doing it all these years for Knopfler, Dire Straits, you know, Eric, The Who, everybody. You know, we've worked together for a long, long time. And they know their stuff. Yeah. And it gives you comfort as a drum tech to know they're in your corner. Yeah. Right. You know, because they can say to me, you know, special stuff like, you know, they'll speak to each other on the phone from front of house to monitors, which is very, very important. And, and uh, our, our front of house, Robert Collins, he'd say, can you just move the bass drum mic over to the left and in about an inch? And I'll hit the bass drum again. And you go, that's it. Yeah. Whereas yeah. most people just shove the mic in there. <clears throat> yeah. And don't do any mic placement, you know. Mm. And they, they, it's just, I sort of think, Christ, things I wouldn't even think of. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm so used to seeing people just ramming the mic yeah, in a hole yeah. and that's it. Yeah, you know, they're all things you need to learn. All little things make a yeah. difference. Sound is a complicated thing. Then I got a couple of alos here. Gary Canton from Ireland. Oh. Said, Hi, you guys. <laughs> Dusty and Andy said good evening, Lee and the Yard. All right. And Michael, who is uh, he's a very important man because he's a, a lorry driver back home. Right. So he brings food to people's tables. <laughs> very important. Hello, he says. And Paul from Merthyr Tydfil. So we got yeah. a few on saying hello. So good evening, yeah. guys. Hello. So we're going to tap into some of the experience, as we said. So you've worked with Mr. Gad. So this is his kit here. Yeah. You've got another one there. Yeah. And, and you've got, got one upstairs. And we've got his main one in the other unit. Right. Under lock and key. Yeah. In flight cases. Lovely. So, this guys, I can't show you everything, but we've got Roger's kits up here. We've got kits over there. Slingerland is there. We've got yeah. snares everywhere. So, besides you being a drum tech, Obviously, you've got the drum yard here. Yeah. So, what do you you do? Do you still rap for people? No, I've stopped doing it now. You stopped the rapping. Yeah. yeah. But you still will. You still selling? Yeah. So are these items for sale and so on. Yeah, yeah. Wow. But um, yeah, I stopped rapping because uh, there was this guy in South Wales who started spraying. <laughs> oh, that's my twin brother, that is. <laughs> my, no, yeah. what, what it was is that Lee the Spray. With what's gone on in the last couple of years, and I'm knocking on now, you know, I'm no spring chicken, so I just thought I'll stop doing that. And because I have to import yeah. all the old raps, yeah, yeah. You know, either from Germany or from the so US. So I actually don't enjoy rapping at all. No. And, I, and my love of it went out the way. And I thought, oh, spraying, and that's a good one. That sounds good to me. And then, um, with the EU thing and everything, I just thought, oh, I can't be bothered. No. With it's, shipping it's, abroad and all you, that. You and ask Lee the spray, it's a, it's a tough one. Yeah. It's hard, hard yeah. craft. Yeah. Mentally hard as well. Yeah, well, it's well for me, I set this up nearly 20 years ago to give me something to do when I wasn't on the road. Yeah. And it served its purpose, and, um, and I've enjoyed it. But with it, it just it, loads of things have come up. It's like driving into London cost me an absolute fortune yeah. with all the charges now. Um, you know, I'm two hours away from London, and um, going to Ronnie Scott's is torture now. Yeah, you know, it's just like trying to get through London without picking up more charges. Cost you forty five quid a day to park. You know, 
then you get hit by charges on the way out. Then, you know, if I do a Ronnie Scotts and they finish at three, I don't get home till six. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I've knocked that side on the head as well. Um, I'm just making it easier for myself, really. Yeah. Because yeah. once you, you, you don't enjoy it so much by the travelling, the time out, and all that kind of stuff, um, I feel I've done my bit. No, it's really, really good. Mm. And the funny thing you mentioned about the enjoyment, about always saying to folk back home, you know, with the students and that, play and enjoy, doesn't matter what you do. If you play mm. down the local pub once a, a fortnight and you really have a good time and you've yeah. got a professional job, then that's great. Because a lot of people are slogging it and not enjoying it, do no, they? No. And, and that's not good. You, you can, should you always can, have a passion. For yes, it. you can see it in their faces, they're not enjoying it. As you know, you've got to go and earn a living. Yeah. And I look at some people and I kind of, you know, feel grateful that I've had two professions that I love. Yeah. You know, and, um, you know, and one of my professions was, you know, as a carpenter and joiner, is being able to fix anything on the kit. Yes. And, and that's one of my sort of fortes, really, of being on the road. Which was, I was going to ask you about that. Are we going to t t mention? So drum tech, yeah. because some of my uh, folk and some that will watch this after won't understand what the drum tech actually mm. does. But you're the man that makes everything work, can't you? As you said, one, to make the drummer feel comfortable and everything yeah. is right for yeah. him. Everything's where he should be. But I think folk don't always realise that if something breaks and you're, you're an hour before you, the, the show yeah. starts or whatever, yeah. the pressure's on you then, isn't yeah, yeah. it? But um, fortunately, you know, we carry lots of spares. You know, I've got a flight case that weighs 100 and nearly 150 kilos, full of bits and pieces for mm. the kits and everything, and plus my tools in there, in there just in case. Um, and it's, it's my sort of comfort box yeah. that I know whatever happens, and then I lay out there. my tools on top that I might, might need in the emergency during the gig. And uh, it just just works. You just learn what you need and what you don't need. So you don't relax when they start playing, do oh, you? No, no. You, I'm, you I'm in a chair watching. to his left. And uh, I'm shielded from the crowd. But I watch every move he makes. You're watching for wing nuts coming undone. You're watching for the pedals. and Because and yeah. he uses a double pedal. Sometimes that comes loose. Or he snaps a beater. Yeah. And I've got a beater tucked in by his bass drum. So if it does go, all I've got to do is lie on my front, quickly whip that one out. But he, he lifts his leg and puts it on the left beater. I was going to say, while he's still playing, you're while crawling playing, underneath. Yeah, I'm groveling. That's great. And, uh, and then I just quickly switch it out, quickly throw it a little bit out of the way. And um, he carries on, just moves his foot back and carries on playing. Great. Yeah. But you need that. I was going to say, you have to be Need really that connected. Yeah. yeah, you have to know each other, don't yeah. you? And, you? and you've got to know the songs as yes. to when you can move in. Yeah. You know. And, and you mentioned something, right? You do the score, do you? Okay. Well, I move the charts. <coughs> yeah, 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 song, yeah, of course. I'll move the chart. And if, you'll get it ready. Yeah, and the tempos and stuff. Yeah. Or you'll do, because I've seen Steve Darwin, well, you'll put um, just literally a, a metal for like four clicks or whatever. Yeah. So you'll set the tempos yeah. ready for me, yeah? Yeah, they're all written down. and on the on the set list and stuff so he knows exactly where he is um yeah it just works lovely your, your job is to make him feel comfortable wow so we're going to talk about tuning because <gasps> you taught me something just now <clears throat> that i hadn't thought about so i'm going to have a good think on that because <laughs> i've gone since being away and then coming back i sort of got my own way of doing it but you tune by Crank it up first, you said, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, you've got to crank, yeah, stretch the head as hard as it, was go, as it will go. And um, so crank it right up. Yeah, you can hear the glue crack. <coughs> wow. And then leave it for, you know, 15, 20 minutes, whatever. That's like a good wine. Yeah. Pour it, leave it, breathe. That's it. Don't drink it too fast. Go to catering, <laughs> have a coffee and a couple of cakes. That's it, and then come back. And then come back, because you've got, you've got to be calm yeah. when you're doing it. So do you loosen the head completely back off, yeah. or just halfway, or do you... No, I, I just, until it, it loses off. tension on the, yeah. on the key. And uh, then you know 
Yeah. So you go back to about hand tight, well, as it yeah, were. Yeah, I, I sort, of, then I sort of count how many turns I do. Because yeah. after a while, you think three turns will do that. Yeah. Um, everyone's got their own system. Whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. you feel comfortable doing. But once you've st stretched it right in, and it won't stretch anymore, then if you don't stretch it enough, that's when you get a dip. Yes, you said, yeah. And then, and then, that's and it, then the it. head's done. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. lost its tone. So you've got to really stretch it in and make and, sure. And, and you mentioned you would prefer for drummers, rather than brand new heads going into a studio, again, play them, isn't it, before yeah. you go in. And yeah. I agree with that put very on, much. Put them on a week before, mm. you know, depending on how much you play. Put them on a week before. I mean, I rarely change heads with Gad or many drummers, you know, they all have their preference. But he loves the snare to stay on as long as possible until it splits. Yeah. You know, it's like just changing it because it doesn't look right. It doesn't work with him. He loves them the thinner they are. And he'll rub it and he'll say, well, get, get the spare up and I'll prepare it. And then he'll rub it at the end of the song and say, no, I think we're still all right for another song. Uh, well, and then if it does go, then never, never, ever tighten your snare cradle. <coughs> the snare won't go anywhere. It's not going to fly up in the air. It's not going to fall off. Just leave it loose. Yeah, just bring yeah. it up and hold. Yeah. Because yeah. you're choking it. You're choking it. Agree. And also you can't get it out quick because you've got to try and climb course, yeah. through his legs to undo the... Yeah. <coughs> so they're all things to speed the process. And you can... Take the old one off with, with that hand and drop the other one in. Yeah, wow. So you get you where the where the strainer is. They always say, "I'll have the strainer there or at six o'clock or I'll have it eight o'clock," and you just hold it in your hand so when you drop it, it's immediately at whichever time, yeah. whether it's six or eight, whatever. Well, I, I very much agree with let it. The problem is with drum heads. If you put brand new ones, it looks lovely, but it, it all looks nice. But but we said earlier, isn't it? what about taping and what about gels and whatever you've got yeah. to do what's right for the place you're in and for the song because at the end of the day it's the sound yeah. that matters isn't it yeah that's all that no one else sees the drummers drum heads do they it's only yeah. you yeah yeah and i do like new drummers and i'm like oh look at them they look lovely oh, yeah, yeah <laughs> but there's, there's that no there is that but i totally agree it's either studio yeah. or or whatever room you're in mm. at the end of the day you've got to get them to work yeah 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 uh, and do you do you, when you're tuning it up for, say, Mr. Gad, then, will you re-look at it with other musicians then? Because the musicians could quite often change the sound of the drum, can't they, when they're playing? Or do you tend to just concentrate on the drums no, no. and leave you, it? You, you just do whatever's required of you for that drummer. If he tells you that's how he wants it, then you just disregard everyone else. Right. Just, that, that's not your thing. You just, you know, like you set the kid up, tune it, and you think, right, that's that's it. And then the rest is down the front of the house. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Because I've, I've done a couple of gigs with people that have rented from me, and then they've had a disagreement with the front of the house. But it's all down to experience, you know. And so I've, I've been called in to go and find out what the problem is. And it's things like the, the front of the house has tried tweaking the drums. Mm. You know, which is not their call at all. Right. Because you know, as a drum tech, you're working for the drummer. Yes. You don't care what front of house thinks. You, know. you fight for the right of the drummer. Well, you have to. That's, yeah. You know, because, you know, if it's, it doesn't sound right to the drummer, then he's not happy. He's not happy. No, I, I totally get that. Yeah. 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 But, you know, some people might try and get you to tune the kit, you know, their way. Well, not drummers, but the you know, front of house or something. It's like, well, no, this is how he likes it. Yeah. So you have to stand. Because you mentioned there, the most, the biggest influence, which everyone would know, really, the biggest influence is how you play. Yeah. So you might sit down there and tap it a little. Doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. sound that great, mm -hmm. but it's the guy is sitting on there, and then he puts his heart yeah. and soul into it. Yeah. The dynamics change according to his feel, doesn't it? Yeah. And each drummer's the same. Yeah. You know, is that that is your job to look over. Oh, the you've got a sale here. Oh, what we saw. Richard Poo, how much for the Royal Ace on the bottom one? <laughs> but but bottom but one shelf. Oh, Royal Ace bottom but one shelf. I were clear where we are. Where are we? We we'll have a look at that. Oh, it must be. It can only be there. Yeah, it can only be down there. Oh, is it? 
That's the only one the camera can see. Mike Skinner, fantastic cook for Carrier to the drumming community in South Wales. Well, there you are, see? It's because all his best mates are Welsh, see? And a worm snare drum heads become smooth. How do you make them usable for brushwork? Ooh, that's a well, technical one. You don't. <laughs> right. So, Andy, what you need to do is you need to message Yard Direct. Or, or you have a spare and, snare. Right. And uh, sling that on quickly and take it off after that song. Oh, wow. Well, Andy will message you if you don't mind and you can tell him. That's, or um, you could try <clears throat> cut, cutting the hoop away from a, a new head and then just slinging that on to the song and then take it off again. There you go. Because we used to do that, we used to cut out the head from the hoop and then put them on, on the tongs to deaden them a little bit. Right. So you've got another head on top of the head. Yes, yes. Without the hoop. Yeah, yeah. Or turn, or, or you can put a snare head on upside down. Sometimes. Wow. Well, Depending on what you're doing. Yeah, we don't see how you're gonna There's lots of trees. I can't tell them everything, otherwise I'll be out of a job. Yeah, what I'm gonna do one day, I'm gonna find you, you're gonna play with Mr. <laughs> Card, and I'm gonna come along for me, and I'm just gonna secretly film you going, boy, what's he doing there? <laughs> And Rob Griffiths, Griffiths from Wales again, good yeah. workly, good boy Rob, he's all right. He knows all the badges about, of, when it comes to Premiers and Ludwigs, he knows every badge and badge numbers. And, and again, because I stayed away from drums for a long time, when I come back, it's folk like Rob and I, didn't he? I, couldn't, I didn't have a clue about yeah. anything anymore. You forget, yeah. see, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. Not a clue, and I wasn't the best at knowing all the names before, mm. so... It's surprising how much I've learned from my customers. Oh yeah, they just come yeah, in and you're tell. Always me. learning, because yeah. you know. I, to be honest, you know, I couldn't care less about badges and numbers and things. It's just how it sounds, you know. Yeah. And um, you know, growing up, I had a Keith Moon double kit, black double premier. Wow. And um, you know, Simon Kirk came along, and I thought, yeah, I've got to have a, a Heyman. And uh, you know he played Ludwig snares and all that as well. And Ludwig was a big thing for me. And um, they just had that nice warm sound mm -hmm. uh, from you know, Gretsch and Ludwig in, in the Motown studios. I grew up on Motown and and rock, you know. Yeah. And just those lovely feels they do. They're so simple yet you never forget them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it is something about Ludwig reaching the heart. Yeah, yeah. It is something about it. Yeah, it's all part, all part of my upbringing, all that kind yeah. of stuff. And, and 60s pop, you know, Ringo with his Black Oyster Pearl Ludwig and the whole thing. And that stays with you. Mm. You know, it's, it's a very influential thing when you're a kid. It's your favourite drummers, you know. It's, it's all of them, like Charlie Watts, you know, the late Charlie Watts, fabulous man. And um, you sort of thank him, really, for providing you with such a good childhood. Mm. You know, to give you that. I had, I had a nice just job. You, you know, oh yeah, feel? well Charlie was a lovely man. Yeah, it was really yeah. good. You'd never think he was a rock star. No. Never. No. You know, he's just nice. impeccable manners. Lovely man. Just. And you said earlier, didn't you, that actually, within this industry, because fame is a funny thing, isn't it? And it can make, yeah. can do funny things it can make to people. Break, yeah. yeah, and you work with people you like. Yeah. I think that's really important for yeah. any young drummer that might watch this. You work, same, you see people with bands doing, they say, oh, look, the band is really giving me stick and the, you know, the singer never turns up and this, this and that. Mm. And I always, straight away, I think, oh, just work with people that right. are decent yeah. and you can work with yeah. because well, otherwise yeah. you're living a life of misery for yeah. nothing. And you've, I've, got, I've got this thing where I only work with, with people I respect. And if they disrespect you, you know, other people, then don't work for them. Yeah. You know, and people, I get calls from people saying, you know, would you go out with so and so? It's like, well, their reputation precedes them. Mm. No. Yeah. You know, I've, life's bad enough trying to live in, let alone working with someone who's a bit too yeah. full on. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. And yeah. your job is there to look after their kit, you're not there to wet nurse them. Yeah. And I couldn't care less who they play for or what the money is or anything like that and it's just go out the same with you know work being in a band go out with people you like being with yeah. 
and enjoy yourself. You're better off doing a, a low level thing with yeah. people that you really get on with. There's yeah. that chemistry in there, and yeah. there's a really good yeah. connection. Good camaraderie. Than working for, uh, uh, for want of a better word, a famous name, but they saw potentials are difficult. Every yeah. time you go to work, you hate yeah. it. Well, uh, That's yeah. of no use at all. Yeah, there's people in the music business that I would never work for, and they're huge. Yeah. But, you know, people try and strip you of your dignity. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> the way they speak to you or they don't speak to you. They refuse to speak to crew and all that kind of stuff. That's not the way to no. work. No. Just, just ignore them, let someone else take the grief. Yeah, yeah. You know, you'll always work, especially if you've got, you've always really, if you're a drum tech or, or you know, crew on the road, you've always got, like, have, have to have a second string to your bow. Yeah. Because it's going to be quiet spells and stuff. Yeah. So, I would always drop drop back on my building business. You know, you come home, you think, and you don't plan it before. You book jobs in for when you finish that tour and things, and um, it makes for a better life. Yeah. But if you're not prepared, because no one works consistently. You know, if you mm -hmm. if you're working for a PA company or a lighting company, you've got more chance because they'll send their guys out on the thing, and you go with it. So. You're doing one tour you've already got the next tour lined up yeah yeah you know but if you're you know self-employed drum tech or guitar tech or whatever there's no guarantee when the next job's coming in mm. i think would you say as well it's quite nice though to to take a break from it oh yeah because then you look forward yeah. to another yeah. one rather than as you said where yeah. you live in and you spend some time at home and yeah and then well, you for think years yeah for years now i've only worked on the road for so four or five months spread over a year. Yeah. I couldn't do a full year on the road. That would drive me insane. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you've got to be grounded. And, yeah. and you've got to come home, enjoy your family. And then you have a break at home. You might spend you know, a few months at home, whatever. And then it gives you a break, clears your head. Yeah. And then you go back out, you know. And I'm no rock and roll hero, you know. I, I love my family and everything. And, there's more to life than stuck on a bus in the yeah, middle of nowhere. I know. I know. You know. And it's just oh. the same routine. We go to the same arenas. You know, we've all been around the world a few times. And just traveling is fantastic. Um, but like anything, after a while, it's... You've seen it. You've seen it. You know, you, you end up probably it's like, going... Um, it's like going to a hotel the first day and seeing the menu. Yeah. And they, yeah. Oh, look at this. Oh, they do this food. Do they do that? If you've been there for two weeks. <laughs> Not that yeah. again. I'll see if I bother nose, I'll kill myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true, isn't it? The brain does do that, doesn't it? It gets a little bit like it next to change. And it gets change. a bit tiresome after a while. Yeah. And it yeah. all depends on who you're with and the camaraderie and stuff. But it's um, it gets repetitive yeah. as well, you know. It's, it's been a fantastic life, but you, you've got to admit, it's not all glamour. No. You know, and we've, we've especially in South America, you know, we've, we've done gigs and then gone to the airport to load the pallets to put on the plane with all the gear, you know, and it's at about four in the morning, you know, and then you go to the hotel, sleep for a few hours, and then you're off again, uh, you know, to catch up with the gear. Do you know, when you say about, like, you can get, as you said, familiar, and then you need to clear it out, yeah. the funny thing is, with the little old shop at Cardiff, I always knew there would be two to three things that needed to be done. Keeps you under a bit of pressure, which yeah. keeps you motivated. Yeah, yeah. But it changes the flavour. To walk in the shop, and that's all you're doing, mm. it's just a shop, yeah. can be very demoralising yeah. if things don't work the way you see. To just teach constantly yeah. is hard graft on the mind, isn't it? Oh, yeah. So the flavours of changing, mm. you spray in, and then in the afternoon, it's like Superman took your coat off, isn't it? and then you're in, you're serving, and then you're <coughs> teaching, and you're doing. I'm constantly, it's like Del Boy, you're constantly on that chase in you for... Mm wanting to make things better, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I think that is good. I, that's how yeah. I feel. It's good for the mind because you're taking a break from from parts yeah. of the business. Yeah. You're moving it around. It keeps you fresh. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. But, you know, I, I, I had my son Nick help me in here today. And uh, did you do the Hoover in? He did. Good. Tell him but he, good. he keeps me on my toes. Yes. You know, because I sort of think, <laughs> the in here. And he's going, come on, we've got to get these jobs done and all that. It's like he employs me now. My wife's the other way, see, she says, oh, come on now. <laughs> yeah, you've worked hard. It's like, I know, but yeah. I can't, I've got to do this. Yeah. 
just no, it's not good to keep them. I mean, I, you know, my family are restaurant people, and my entire family have worked hard all their lives, yeah. and um, we've never. I don't think any of us really have done a normal eight till four or five work. We've always, you know, even when I was in building, you know, I'd leave here at sort of six in the morning, depending where I'm going. Um, might drive for six hours a day, then yeah. back, yeah. and then done a full day's work. You still got yeah. not work out. You can't just say, "Well, I'm travelling, so I'm going to do less work." So you said you did shop fitting as well, didn't you? And that's notorious yeah. for yeah, yeah. long hours yeah. through the night. Yeah, done all, all got to be that. done. Yeah, he ghost us through the night. Yeah. And when when they say, you know, we've got to be open and ready for business at nine a.m. You you can't turn it down. You just go. Right, yeah. you've got to do it, yeah. and despite how tired you get, but things are easier these days. At least you've got like twenty-four hour McDonald's and stuff, you, <laughs> yeah. and delivery. Yeah. In those days, once your sandwiches, yes, were done, very true. That was it. You, I know. You relied on a packet of crisps. I, I, I used to take sugar in my coffee, right? And I could manage tea. My mother was always one of these that don't have sugar. I could manage tea without sugar or half, but I was not to have sugar in coffee. I was like, oh, and I was. Uh, installing steelwork yeah. in, in, a, in a big plant somewhere and the canteen was there which is basically tea and coffee yeah. and that was the problem there was a spit of milk left no <laughs> sugar and I, and I, yeah. there wasn't a choice it was either drink our coffee or you were going to have nothing yeah. after 16 hours you just did it and I never took the sugar again after that. Yeah. Look at that, that stopped yeah. me. It's just good. Yeah. <laughs> right, Sk uh, Mike Skinner asks, uh, has Yard ever used the lock-in tension rods carried sampled on the pool? Um, if so, what was his opinions of them? I don't know, well, what's I'll that? You, I'll tell you, never used them, didn't know about them. What did I, <laughs> what did I sample then? I don't know. I'm not, I'm not keen on lock-in stuff. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, my my brain. I've had a long drive up, mine. So I'm, I'm, I'm my brain. Yeah. What is it? Yeah, he just says yard has ever used the lock. Type a bit more for us, Mike, before we finish. Exactly what are you talking about? Well, I don't remember sampling anything. Right. On the pearl snare, it might have, but I can't remember. Anyway, fantastic. So interesting from Paul. So we talk one more thing, and that is the dreaded bearing edges. Um, and a lot of people do argue a lot on this. My my point to you all again is, at the end of the day, this man knows right. where the bearing edges make a difference or not. Right. And secondly, well, we're gonna you can mention you can hear, what's the most important thing of all with the drum kit. The sound. Yeah, but it's the it's the player we said, isn't it? Or it's the way it's the you player. play. It's the player. It's always the player. Thing is, like every. Everyone who wants to buy a kit from me, which drives me mental, is how are the bearing edges? And it's like, if I told you, you wouldn't know. And it's not an arrogant statement. It's because all you need to do, you need to walk into a shop, you see a four piece kit set up, and you need to go to it and just do one hit on each branch. And even come back up. That's how Ginger used to do it. it. You come back from the toms, from the floor toms, back up, to see if they're in tune with each other. Another thing I learned from him. And um, that's all you need to know. You don't need to know about bearing edges. And it's kind of ingrained in drummers now to, mm. to ask about bearing edges. Mm. You know? And we would never ever strip the heads off the drum to see how the bearing edges are, unless we're actually changing the heads and we notice a deal. Or something is wrong, isn't yeah, it? Like drastically, yeah. think what's going on here? But if it sounds it. okay, yeah. the bearing yeah. edges are fine. Yeah. But you know, I, I can do bearing edges very quickly. Yeah. You know, it's like, just put them on the router table, whiz it round, check them, give them a rub down with sandpaper and all that sort of stuff, and then check that the shell's, you know, flat. Um, but people need to practice more on their tuning. Yeah. But some people seem to think if you redo the bearing edges, all of a sudden your drums are going to sound fantastic. Mm -hmm. But what they've got to do is check 
their own tuning and take more time over it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but I think it's it's an excuse, you know. Christ. <coughs> oh dear. <coughs> Anyone got a glass of water? <laughs> but, yeah. but you're right. Take your time. It, go yeah. gentle. Experiment yeah. and play and try. Yeah. yeah. You know, be this, patient with them. Yeah. In the best bearing edges in the world, and like we were saying earlier, all the companies. You know, in the eighties, everyone was using pearl drums. Then it was DW and Yamaha. All those companies, Sona, whatever, make great drums. You know, yeah. the, the wood machinists who set up the, the saws and the you know the routers and all that kind of thing. They're all good at what they do, and they all come out perfect. And the drum in itself is a simple instrument, isn't it? It's very simple. You know, you know, it's not. And, and we overcomplicate, don't we? Yeah. I think partly we said earlier today that I think we overcomplicate because companies need to bring a new product out. Yeah. They need to sell. Oh, yeah. They? Every now. It's so, like they're all going mental. Yeah. So if they discuss the bearing edge in a, in a way that we all go, yeah. wow, yeah. then it's like science fiction. They say, woo, look at that. Yeah. But that's because they need to say something to make the product exciting, yeah. isn't it? And that's, As you yeah. said, if it's clean to me, Leave the spray always says clean flat, clean, yeah. and just make sure there's no nonsense on there Is or yeah. paint and whatever. Yeah. I did um I did a, a lovely gretch for somebody, he brought it down and it was bad. We couldn't he said I've been ages and ages, can't get it to him. When I took the heads off, they were a bit naughty, it was an old one. They painted it in the factory and the paint went up all over the bare edge with the brush hairs yeah. all over from the factory. <laughs> And the funny thing is, you said because I think the customer thought I was going to come up with something magical about it, yeah. and I said it's just dirty. It's just that this lumps of paint. Yeah. So I just took it in, sand block by hand, yeah. just smoothed it, rubbed it down, put it back on, and it was just yeah. lovely straight yeah. away. Yeah. It was good. Yeah. So, so concentrate on your playing more. Yeah. Concentrate on spending on time tuning. with the kit, yeah. understanding the kit, yeah. and don't get too bogged down. Yeah. One one guy. Just quick, one chap said to me when I put this out on, on YouTube, and he said it makes all the difference, etc., etc. And when you go in the studio, they they put five toms and they're all slightly different, and they mic them all, and they could tell then there's a difference. I said, but that doesn't doesn't that prove they've had to go to that extent of examine it to to the absolute <coughs> to realise there is a slight difference. Now, who yeah. on earth in an arena or a pub would ever? pick up on that yeah. it's impossible yeah, it and, and what studio or live event as a router on the side just in case <laughs> nobody yeah. has that do they i think i think people invent things to talk about with with all that with the bearing edges yeah, yeah. it's like you know next we'll have a big discussion on cymbal felts yeah you know and uh it's the same with cymbals you know um i could set up 500 cymbals on that wall out there blindfold someone yeah and say come in here what's your first thing i'd say outside would be what's your favorite symbol brand and they would tell me they say i wouldn't use anything else it's always yeah, got to be yeah, that yeah i could bring them in here <coughs> or go to memphis drum shop he's got hundreds of symbols hanging up go around blindfolded pick out the ones you want and it won't be the he won't be his favorite and you'll be lucky to get one of your favorites i know I always tell people the same again with the bearing edge, you or or, or with the snares etc. When they get a little bit too precious about it, I say yeah. you can tune. There's a range. I hope you agree with me now. We live. There's a range with most drums that you can achieve, yeah. and if some can go a bit higher, yeah. some can go a bit lower. But I reckon out of all the snares, you've got what forty snares per year or so. A blind test. I could probably make most of them sound very very similar. Yeah. We. A, a person won't be able to come in and go, oh, that's the slingland no. and that's this. They, they, they wouldn't, wouldn't be they able wouldn't, to do it. You know, and and if you want to slingland or you want a Ludwig snare, yeah. that's fine, yeah. as you say. But don't get sewing up as if that's going to cure mm. the problems we have that we haven't practiced enough. Yeah, yeah well, exactly. Yeah, but the thing is with it, with it all, is is we we're sort of worrying too much about the technicalities rather than just going out, yeah. enjoying playing with our friends. Yeah. You know, yeah. Whatever you do, whether it's a pub band, you know, or you just love playing rehearsals. Yeah, go out and it done. You you don't have to have a record deal and all that kind of stuff. It's it's the same as a game of football. Yeah. You know, people get together like tonight. 
on a cold, windy pitch. And they'll have a kick about with their mates, five a side, whatever. And they'll come back, and that's it. Yeah. They'll just say, I had a great time. And, and, that's all you want yeah. to and that's how you want it with playing music. Yeah. Just say, I've had a real good rehearsal with my mates. and all that. We're not gigging, but we just love getting together. Yeah. Or sticking the cans yeah. on, you close your yeah. eyes and just play an yeah. album or whatever you want yeah. to do. Yeah, but my, my yeah. sons have all played, you know, I used to play. And I remember when they were growing up, how excited they were to get into a band. You know, Nick was playing guitar for the band when he was in his, he was 15, with older people. Yeah. And, you know, it carried on from there. I used to have him on the road with me, working for different bands. You know, he did Annie and Alex with me and different, uh, he did Ringo with us as well. And um, he grew up checking until he got his chance. And then he took it. Yeah. You know, and he, you know, he was Johnny Marr's guitar tech as well. And um, he just loves playing. He always has done. And, uh, you know, Martin works for the script. He's, he's done gigs with him. You know, when Glenn's not been uh, available. And the main thing is that comes through all those people is how much they love it. Yeah. And, and when you just do it to earn money or whatever reason you do it, if it's not just for the enjoyment, then it's the wrong yeah. way of doing it. Money is a killer and fame is a killer. Yeah. Uh, but, doing but, it to be you know, famous I mean, and be above everybody else. Yeah. You know, I, do that. I get fairly paid <clears> what I do, but um, there's people that I've worked, you know, like Simon Kirk, you know, he's called me about different stuff. It's like, I never discuss money with him. It's just like, yeah, I'll do it. Mm. Because you know of, what, you're gonna of enjoy. what he gave to me in the last 50 years. Yeah. You know, just listening to what he does and I just love that solid stuff he does and he's a lovely bloke. And I didn't know but when I lived in Notting Hill, he was living with Kossoff, just the other side of Labrick Grove from me. Could have walked there in four minutes. Uh -huh. you know? And I think, oh, if only I knew when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. But there's, there's, there's different reasons for doing things, but once it's all about money and trying to become trying to become famous, it's the worst thing yeah. you can do. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's because you're chasing, you're chasing, you're the chasing, thing, you're chasing the, you're chasing the, music is a beautiful gift, isn't it? And yeah. yeah, if you can create music, it's fun. Yeah. You know, um, well, good, you know, I've still got mates around here who I played with when I was in my teens, and they're still writing music for their own pleasure and putting yeah. it out and whatever, you know. And I think it takes some doing, you know, they've not become jaded or anything, they know they're not going to get a record deal or. Yeah, oh, I know, enjoy, enjoy it. Yeah. Look at them. They just, mm. as I said to you, I, I got in my own shop and I come in here <coughs> and when I pulled up outside, you've got small doors and you know, you're in the corner yeah. and, and it's like a TARDIS in here. And the minute I walked in and just saw this, I'm like, oh, look at this, this is fab. <coughs> to me, that's that's all that matters. Yeah. These are just, they're yeah. fab. Yeah. Yeah. There's something about them. We've got two more questions before we finish. Uh -oh. So any advice on tuning, and he's asking again, top higher than bottom or vice versa? Uh, <clears throat> bottom higher than the top. Is it? Yeah. About a quarter of a turn. Yeah. So that's where the tone comes from. Yes. The reso head. Yes. And uh, the other thing is, every day when I set the kit up, the first thing you check are the reso heads. Yeah, because everyone goes for tops, don't they? Yeah, always? and they start doing the top, and then they mm. get flustered, because if the bottom's not right, the top won't be right. Yeah. So you're chasing your own tail. So always flick it over, tap round it, try and get them all equal. And then when that's done, flick it over and then do the batter. Or do all the reso heads at the same time. Mm. Flick them over and then a couple of taps, you think, yeah, that's all right. But if you don't do it that way, then you're going to be chasing your own tail. You'll get flustered and then your tuning gets worse and worse and worse. Well, there you go. Look at that. There you go. And then Mike love him. I think what he was trying to remember now, we had a pearl snare drum in. Uh, I was going to do a video. The video never came out. And what we had was the locking tension rods from Pearl. You know, they got like a little red piece in the centre. Oh, yeah. So as you tighten them up, <clears throat> then you, you wind the middle and it's it's got um the tension rod is split. Like yeah, you put yeah. a hacksaw oh, through yeah, yeah. and it splits them open and it's meant to hold them. And we did a bit of a test on that. They did work. But is it worth 
all that amount of effort when you consider I, do, I, I think um, the jury was out so personally for me and you know I've got some great friends at Pearl Pearl made fabulous drums yeah yeah if you want a good drum sound I used to work for FM to feature you hear their stuff they're Pearl drums at the time they're good and then one of my favourite bands Thunder Harry James you listen to his stuff like Thunder live at Donington back in the early 90s uh, or their albums whatever Harry's always had a great sounding kit mm. and um, and it was only the fact that you know things become popular for whatever reason DW did loads of colours and different things you know um, that people change but there's absolutely nothing wrong with any of the top brands yeah, yeah. it just depends what you like the look of yeah you know. but when I was a kid I went for looks you know I just go I just thought at the time I did, never had any lessons or anything I just thought drum kit's a drum kit to me you know and if it sounds right yeah that's the one you know but um yeah Pearl did good stuff but I found because Yamaha did a similar thing in their in their lugs and it ruins I have this thing like there's a feel of the drum kit yeah 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 you know and when you start tightening it up you lose that, <coughs> that sense of feel where you yeah. know it's slightly out I always work by feel purely on the basis <coughs> that doing steel work all my life I've done probably a million nuts and bolts of all various sizes and sometimes with the job I would have is that if you're working in uh, like paper mills and stuff we'd be underneath mm. and you cannot physically see the bolt that you're yeah. attaching yeah. to the product you've got underneath there and of course you're feeling mm. and it helps you with your left hand as well so yeah. you, you're like that and it could be a little five mil tiny little nut and bolt and it's all about that yeah. it's nothing to yeah. do with what you're looking at no. and then the next ones would be big bolts so I've always gone yeah, with yeah, that yeah. but I have learned something today and that is that you still do that Cranking up and coming back. I was like, yeah. oh, and, and the rezzo. Yeah. I, I see you're going to kill me for this. No, I've always sort of said to to folk when they ask, I do tell them to concentrate on the rezzo, but I also mention on the top head, <clears throat> try and get the feel you want because you want to feel from the drums. Yeah. So what I've advised, <laughs> you, you're going to kill me. Going on. I think work. <clears throat> I've definitely agree with you work those drum heads like a bass guitar string a lot of bass players don't like new strings do they? Yeah, yeah. because they want to work them in so keep working and working until that kit starts to gel yeah. never put a bass drum drum head on say the like sound of my kit thump the blasted thing get yeah. it working yeah. and it feels like a new pair of shoes and it'll work yeah. so i agree with that <clears throat> i've always said if if i don't like playing a sloppy sock i'd, I'd do it if it was a studio because that's what they need, but not if you're playing for a couple of hours. I want a, a, a feel back from yeah. the kit. So I tend to lean on, get that, and then work on the underside to try and get the yeah. best tone within that. Yeah. And then I compromise the top head if I want a bit more tone to feel. I'll, I'll go sort of in between well, the two. You're, you're right there, because what, what I do with Gad is, is it's a question of sound and response yes yeah so we generally take the toms up a bit higher so it gets a stick response there you go and then i damp it with either moon gel there you go or his old method was a bit of gaffer tape with some tissue oh or, i feel good now because it wasn't what, 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 the way but what i do save looking for tissue there's always toilets in an arena. Yes. Oh, you, yeah. A bit of Hendrix. <laughs> and then the poor boy that goes goes into the toilet. He goes, it's not toilet paper. Drunk, no, it's the yard has got it. <laughs> no, that, that, that's the old thing. We just fold it up a few times and then yeah. a little bit on the on the toms. But it brings it, it down in pitch a little bit. But he's got the stick response he needs for his... Yes. His, his, uh, there we are. I'm glad we asked him. now. Because I, I do feel that you want to you want to feel that kept in your yeah. balance. But there's a lot of people <clears> that, that that talk a load of rubbish, you know, about I don't want to see tape or moon gel on you know on my heads and stuff. But you know, working with Steve Jordan, you know, he's he's got snare drums that are absolutely smothered in black gaffer. You don't see a bit of white mm. anywhere because he gets 
the right sound for the track he's playing. Yeah. If it's an old blues, you know, he wants an old 40s sound and stuff. And um, it's not about being pedantic and stuff, because that, that will ruin your time in the studio from people taking too long to tune up. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so he just does what's needed, and that's what my job is. I'll do anything that gets me the sound yes. in the studio, because you're talking about a lot of money to stand in, uh, you know, whatever studio you're in, it's not cheap. No, I know it is yeah. cheap. You've got staff of like four or five in the studio as well. Yeah. Any music producer that's with you and they are sound engineer will always say they yeah. want to get that sound. Yeah, but for me, the, the best sound ever for you know for this type of music was was uh, came from Glenn Johns. You know when he got the Zeppelin sound, mm. and uh, it's like you know the Johns family. You've got Andy Johns and Ethan Johns now, and they kind of nailed it years ago. You know, Glenn Johns and his brother done so many incredible albums. And I'm thinking, there's a lot of people still chasing their tail for no reason. Yeah. You know, learn their techniques, give it a go. Yeah. You've got yeah, nothing to lose. And because we live in a very modern world as well, you can buy everything digital. Mm. And then sound engineers, they go on and they buy a plug-in and another plug-in and another plug-in yeah. and then sampling the snare to drop on top mm. of that. And okay, there might be times, yeah. but the problem is, as I said, the, the foundation of that kit is wrong. Yeah. You could pull all the plug-ins in and then you start engineering it mm. and it'll always have that feel when it, yeah. that it's overproduced. It yeah. doesn't yeah. have free flow. No. No. And that's, that's my only thing with clicks. You know, if you're using track, then you've got to use a click. Yeah. But generally, I like the Stones method. It's just like, just roll the tape, let's go. Yeah. Yeah. 20 beats a minute faster at the end. Yeah, yeah. Again, yeah. Who cares? But, you know, it, it kind of ruins yeah. the music, I think. There, there's a, yeah, you're there's... concentrating on the click rather than playing <coughs> the song. Yeah. yeah. But, it's a hard balance, that, isn't it? Because modern, yeah. so much modern people are so used to everything that will be in quantized. Yeah, yeah everything's got to be dead perfect. Yeah. And, and really, I don't like that. Mm. You know, I like bands that just ebb and flow and life is good to see yeah. for that to me yeah, yeah i love i love bands like pearl jam and stuff and uh, you know that they make going on stage look fun you know uh, we've done gigs with pearl jam and it's great you know they they're looking like they're enjoying it yeah you know but weirdly weirdly through music and stuff um i found only a while ago that when i when i was 16 my, myself and my two brothers my two older brothers we lived in a bed sit in Earl's Court where my parents had their restaurant. And, uh, and Jimi Hendrix died in 1970. When I lived around the corner from the hospital, we got taken to Mary Abbott's. And, and then recently I found that his producer, who I'd worked with, Eddie Kramer, we did, we did recordings of Zeppelin drums and all this sort of thing for all that. And then then I found out that while I was living there, I was a neighbour like next door to Tony Visconti, who became T Rex and Bowie's wow. uh, and all that. And I'm thinking, how weird that all those years ago you end up yeah. coming through at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, the whole circle, circle thing. Because yeah. you know? Bowman lived a few streets from me in, in Notting Hill. You know? And it's weird how you just don't know, do you? You walk no, past them in the street. You've not got a clue but you mentioned earlier didn't you, that, that a lot of stuff is because you're in the right place at the right time and that's all it is <coughs> and been, then someone been, says oh would you mind doing yeah. this for me and then and then away well, you go when i was working for the who and that was through zach um and then our production manager was keith moon's drum tech and uh, i met i met steve gadd at uh, hyde park when he did that it was eric claps and the who Bob Dylan, Alanis Morissette, a few others. And then through that, he said to me, would you like to come and look after Gad with Eric? And I met Gad that day. But I know two other Steve Gads. Oh. <laughs> you know, one was Nico McBrain's tech for years. He used to be the drummer in a band called Charlie. Right. He was Steve Gad. And, um, and the other was a local singer to us who went to school down the road from us was Steve Gadd who used to sing with Stray 
And it's funny what a small world it is and how you come across each other. And then yeah, when yeah. I was doing the Albert Hall, Steve Gadd from Stray turned up. And it's just just being in the right place at the right yeah. time, basically. <clears throat> but you did say this particular Mr. Steve Gadd. Yeah. He's a pain in the bum, you said. Did I say that? <laughs> no. To put everybody to rest, by the way, Mr. Gadd is a very lovely man. I better check my pension. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he has to say that. No, he is. I, I do ask, I, I like to know those things. Oh, he's good. Is the guy, that, is, the, yeah. is, is the man that you're working with, is he? It, it, do you know, I think people get disappointed when someone who they admire or really appreciate their play and they just find out that he's a book and they're not a nice man. I, I, I get really frustrated with that. So to ask you and for you to say he's a really good guy, yeah. it's like, yeah, I like that, you know? Yeah, no, the, the, everyone I've worked with has been good. Yeah. You know, because I do that thing where it's, if they're not, I don't work with them. And it's not my arrogance, it's just I choose not to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, really nice. Good. The good thing about that was that I always had a second occupation to fall back on. Yeah. But if I had to earn my money, solely from being a drum tech, I'd have probably done them, you know. Yeah, yeah. Because I had that luxury. Of yeah, you own. could pick. Yeah. But if you haven't got that luxury, I understand people got to pay bills, yeah. you know, especially if you've got a family and stuff. Yeah. No, so, it's all good. So it's good. And we said, when Mr. Gard comes back over to this country, then he's going to, my wife's going to make some pasta. She's Italian and Mr. Gard's wife's Italian family. Well, I think Pino's family might be. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, that's true. Do you want restaurant or homemade? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mark. Sorry, we, Mark. I think we might be. <laughs> no, nah, he's good. No, we'll all go there. We'll all go there to Mark's. There we are. Right, we're going to wrap it up because we have actually been, we could be here all night. I genuinely yeah. can say that. Because we were chatting for nearly two hour and a half before we started. We haven't spoken I about, could stay here for a week. We haven't spoken about the UK's version of Steve Gadd. Who's that? Ash Stone. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, we talked about Ash another day. We talked about Ash <laughs> another day. Because this is about your experiences and, and the tuning in. And, and, and then folk have learned something today. I appreciate that. That's really oh, good. So, no, that's what never know, you know. They might be sitting at home going, no kidding. Well, if someone has a different opinion, as you said, it's up to them. Yeah. Each to their own, and they can they can do what they want. But the main thing is, with everything in life, if you don't like a band, don't slate them. Yeah, yeah. Just, just you just do your block thing. Them out. Yeah, just yeah. just go with a band you like. But yeah. people feel if they don't like a, a band or a film star or whatever, you have to get on and slate them. Yeah, you, know, yeah, you just yeah. say, I'm not a fan. So yeah. So if you don't want to do it, you tune in in your way. They don't have to do they? But, no, no, you do but, whatever you want to. But do. everybody be doing that tomorrow now. They'll be cranking up, yeah. thinking. And I want commission. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, we're going to close up. Yeah, As yeah, you yeah. said, otherwise we will be here all night, and and the wives will be uh, shouting at their husbands and whatever, and their children will be going, come what's, on, what's what's the time time we have been on an hour. And oh, my wife would be watching Corey by now. <laughs> <laughs> Right, yeah, thank you. Lovely to meet you. Really, and you, really. lovely to meet you. Yeah. It was a bit, great privilege for me. Right, take care all, and um, if you're watching after the event, take care. Keep watching, and we'll see you soon. Yeah. We've got, I'm going to buy some drums now. <laughs> I've got my card machine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're still on. You'll have to stay oh, now for a while. There, I couldn't find my button.